So it's interesting this particular passage would, uh, would come up at this moment. And you're saying, oh, really? How, how interesting is that? Well, the fact is you just had something really good to eat, didn't you? Those of you who bothered to come, say an amen to those who made the food. Amen. amen. Thank you very much. We are very grateful that you came to our second annual uh, uh, Christmas morning breakfast. And if you want to just make your way from Reno here again next year, please do. Uh, my friends from Reno came. And because I didn't look at my texts, they went and ate breakfast somewhere else. But then they came here and had, as the, uh, uh, those uh, who, who know uh, uh, Tolkien will know, they had second breakfast. <laughs> Second breakfast. So if you had a first breakfast somewhere else and you were able to have second breakfast with us, great. Because this beginning of our time together this morning has to do with food. And it has to do with that, that incredible trance. Did you like that translation? Other vis uh, others translated vision. Okay, let's just say it, was a, it, it, it wasn't a food coma because he hadn't eaten yet. So it must have been some sort of hypoglycemia. No. <laughs> I don't know whether Peter was a diabetic or, or had a problem, but he certainly was hungry. The Bible says he was hungry and the food was not ready. And so he went up onto the roof and he's lying down and he's waiting for the call to come to food, to come from the people that he's staying with. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. Now, uh, I've looked into this and... Uh, this is because my Irish ancestors also may have worked with leather. They were leather workers. And uh, apparently you need to be in a place where there's lots of water and there's also uh, a, a good sewage system. And you know in the old days the sewage system was probably the ocean. So likely where uh, he is staying is near to the ocean. And, and so you, you've got this house near to the ocean. He's on top of the house. He's listening to the waves. It rocks him to sleep. And in his sleep, he sees the most horrific thing. And then he hears the voice of God. Kill and eat. Now we're blessed today to have a, a returned son of ours who has been uh, to boot camp and back. Raise your hand, young man. Where are you? There he is. Thank you for your service. Right there. Thank you. And the fact that, that he is driving the best looking Cadillac I have ever seen in the parking lot. Those of you who like cars like I do, you can have a look afterwards. Yes, uh, you need to see this one. It's amazing. Um, he is told to kill and eat. But what is in the sheet that has been let down is what concerns him and why he gives a response that we need to pay attention to today. Lord, you know that a good Seventh-day Adventist like me has never eaten the unclean meat. But God had said, kill and eat. Many are the Christians today who want to use this particular experience of Peter to say that you can eat anything you like. I'm just going to set the record straight right now and say this is an allegory. Please understand that from this text and also know that the prohibitions on unclean foods that also preceded the giving of the Levitical Code with the flood. How many sheep went into the ark? Remember? Seven by seven. Uh-huh. The clean animals that were going to be needful for food while on the ark for Noah and his family went into the ark seven by seven. Have you done the calculations? Anyone done the calculations as to how long Noah was on the ark before the door was opened again? Come on. You've never done this on a Sabbath afternoon? Tried to figure out how long was this guy actually on the boat? Most calculations come out to about a year. 
So how did God feed Noah and his family for a year? Well, seven by seven. The clean animals went onto the ark seven by seven. So Leviticus and what was given in the Levitical code was something that came as a reminder of the provision of God. Now, I know all you vegans out there are just recoiling. (laughs) I understand. I understand. And I do know that there is a political component to what I am saying right now, and I'm not advocating eating of flesh. However, there was some really good uh, fried chicken last night. Okay. Thank you, Scorpion. Thank you, Scorpion, for providing. There was actually also some pulled pork, which we chose not to serve. Okay. So there are choices that you make. End of parenthesis. Okay. Peter sees this sheet come down not just once, not just three times the sheet comes down and he is told to kill and eat. Very strange. Very strange vision. But at the end of the third time, the sheet goes away and there is a loud knock on the door. Who's there? Well, it wasn't some Jewish people. It wasn't some Israelite people. It was some Gentiles. Now, some of you who have borne with me over this last uh, year, almost two years now, know that I have stricken from my vocabulary the following phrase, non-Adventist. I no longer use this phrase as it correlates quite precisely to the word goyi or goyim or Gentile. And it's largely because of this vision and this is why I bring it to your attention today. This knock on the door brings these Gentile men who had been sent from the house of Cornelius, who had been praying to the God of heaven one day, and in prayer he was visited by an angel. (coughs) Don't believe me? Read it for yourself. It's the, pre- it's the preview to this particular moment when you have Peter on the roof, hungry for lunch, and God uses his hunger to teach him a, an, an incredible lesson, which I believe is the absolute amazing lesson of Christmas. Peter goes down, he greets them, and they say, Cornelius, our boss, has sent us to you because the angel said... Go find Peter at the house of the Tanner in Tanner in Joppa and bring him back to this house. He has some news for you. Now, Peter at this moment had never been in the house of, nor had he associated with Gentiles. And now you have these two that have come to the door and they are going to take him back. So Peter gets his his entourage. I I don't know whether they gave him a to-go bag or not, uh, but but, because we're not told that he waited to eat, but he goes with these men and he meets Cornelius. Now, who is Cornelius? Cornelius is a centurion. What is a centurion? Raise your hand, please, if you have at least found out what a centurion is in your biblical studies? Oh, Lord, I think I've got some work to do in 2019. Okay, a centurion is a Roman officer at the head of a hundred men. Let's let's test our our latest, most newly minted uh, uh, military man. If you are at the head of a hundred men, what is your rank in the army? Does anyone know? I've got a feeling it's more than a... Is, is, is that a platoon? No. Okay, is it more than a platoon? Yes. So you'd probably be like a major, at least, right? Let's just say at least a captain, maybe even a major. This is not just any person in the, in the Roman military. This is a person who has been entrusted with a hundred men under his command. And the Bible says that he was a God-fearer. 
God rewarded his willingness to get to know him and he visited him with an angel ostensibly because there was no person who God could tap at that moment to tell Cornelius that he was listening and that he had been heard and that he was going to be blessed. So he sends an angel. I have it on good authority because I'm very good friends with the leaders of Adventist Frontier Missions, my friends, that there are more and more instances in our world today where there are angels visiting people. Where there are angels visiting people because they believe in angels and they don't believe Christians. But when the angels say to go and find the people of the book, the people who worship on the seventh day, it is very interesting when these people finally find us and ask us, are you the people of the book? Are you the people who worship on the seventh day? Because the angel told me to come and look for you. Same thing is happening here in this story. And Peter does what he has never done before. He steps into the house. This would normally have meant that he would have become ceremonially unclean. Now, do you see where the correlation is coming? God says, what God has said is clean, is clean. No matter if you thought that it was unclean, if God says it is clean, then you go ahead and do whatever he says. In this case, it didn't mean so much food as being changed from clean to unclean, or unclean to clean. It was, you have thought that the Gentiles were unclean and that any association that you might have with them would cause you too to be unclean and therefore you were instructed never to go to the house of a Gentile. <coughs> Peter steps over the threshold, breaking a lifetime of tradition because he was told to by God. He meets Cornelius. Cornelius is very happy that he has come because he knows that he has a word of the Lord from Peter coming to himself and what Peter finds at his whole household, which is an entire household of people, the extended family and friends, just like our gatherings are going to be now at Christmas. This is why the story correlates so nicely. Here comes Peter to give the word of God to somebody who has been instructed by an angel to go and look for Peter and bring him to give him the good word. What happens next blows Peter away. And the people who came with him because Peter decided he wasn't going to go alone. You ever felt like that? When, you, when you're going to give up on all the traditions that you've ever had in your life and, and you're going to move into something else in your life. You, you, kind of want, you kind of want a wingman with you, don't you? Maybe two. <laughs> you know, are going to do this together, right? We're going to jump together. So they're there together. And as they're there together, my friends, tongues of fire come down on the gathered group of people. Cornelius and his friends get the same treatment as the 120 who had been in the upper room. Peter is totally blown away. I thought this was just for us. Wrong. Because it's not you, Peter. It's not you, church, who decides who is clean and unclean. It's not us who decides who is righteous and unrighteous. It is not us who decides who Jesus is going to save. And so he sends his Holy Spirit upon these individuals and they start praising God. They start being the same kinds of people as the, 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 the ones who were in the upper room who had done what Jesus said was go back to the upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit. They are inspired. They are possessed, as we talk, talked about last week. 
hope I didn't make you too uncomfortable with the use of the word possession, because I do believe that that should be our prayer. It was Cornelius' prayer to have the Holy Spirit come into his heart and be resident there. That's how we ended last week, if you remember, singing that little song. Into my heart. Cornelius had sung that song. And the Spirit of God had heard. He had said, go get Peter. I want Peter to learn a lesson. And I, I, I also am going to show you that if you ask Jesus into your heart, he will come and he will come in power and you will be possessed of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that in the last days, there will be, there will be visions there will be visions, there will be dreams. And it won't just be the old that have these things, it will also be the young that will have these things. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm believing that we are living in those days. I'm believing that, that God's Spirit is being poured out on all flesh. Love that word, flesh. Jesus, you see, Jesus came and He was enfleshed. That's the, the easier word to use than the word incarnation. Unless, of course, you speak Spanish. And then you understand the word carne because that's the word for flesh. So in English, our translation might be enfleshment. I want to remind you of what I said last week because it is true today as it was last week and that is that we have been called to be the enfleshment of God in this time and in this place that he would love for us to be his hands and his feet to be having him in our mind directing us so that when we speak to others we are speaking the words of God just like Peter was invited to speak to Cornelius, who up until that moment he had felt was unclean. No, God is calling. God is calling us. And you see, the reason that, that, that this excites me so much at Christmas time is because love came down. I don't know, but the more I think about who God is and, and, and who I am, I realize the incredible gulf that exists between the Creator God and His creation. And yet, He came up with a, a way, a, a device. A, it's, hard, it's hard for me to use words that don't have baggage, okay? So I say it to you this way, and maybe, maybe you want to cogitate upon this at Christmas time. Jesus is that aspect of God that he uses to communicate with his creatures. We're talking about the God of the universe. The God that made all the stars. All the universe. He needed to communicate with me. How was he going to do that? Except by becoming a human being. The miracle and the mystery of Christmas is that God sent His Son to be human so that He could communicate His love to us. That's why when we say God is love, we've got to mean that this person that we get to know in the Scriptures as Jesus is God talking to us in human form? And just, just so that you're, you're, you're clear, it was decided about three or four hundred uh, years after Jesus was here that, that, that he is 100% God.
God and 100% human at the same time. So don't think that I'm, I, I'm saying one or the other because those tend to be called heresies in the Christian church. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is God with us. That's why we call him Emmanuel. El is the name of God. Believe me, I was told this because Michael is my name. Michael. It's also the name of the archangel that stood on the side opposite another former archangel known as Lucifer. So, if you have some time, and I know you will, and you're finished watching It's a Wonderful Life, I know you've got your stack waiting, okay? You might want to take the time to look at how God has communicated with us over the years and that he has used Jesus to do that. He has used Jesus as a way of coming down and inserting himself into our society as human beings so that people like Nicodemus would actually get a chance when Jesus says to him in that nighttime visit, say it with me, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So my friends, let us not be Peter before this moment. Let us not be Nicodemus the teacher of Israel before this moment, let us be those individuals who realize that love came down at Christmas. Love comes down in the form of a baby wrapped in his father's grave clothes. Yes, every good Israelite traveled with swaddling, what? Wrapping cloths. Why? Because maybe he didn't make it to his destination and he had to be buried along the way and so he took the swaddling clothes with him. Yes, Jesus was wrapped in his father's grave clothes as a baby. Where was that manger? It was in Bethlehem, my friends. Go to Bethlehem today and you will find that a lot of people lived in caves. In the fact that the big church in Nazareth is built over the top of a cave should tell you that they also lived in caves in Nazareth. Soft stone meant that they could dig it out, they could make a house there. So where did Jesus end up after he was taken off the cross? In an unused cave. I don't know about you literary people, but this looks like some amazing bookends to me, doesn't it? He's born in the back cave of the inn, laid in the feed trough from which the bread of life could be consumed. And then he dies and is placed again in a cave. From which he rises out of his own power and strength, victorious. He is the king of the world. Let no one be mistaken about that fact. The Bible says the devil knows that his time is short. He has known this since Jesus resurrected. The entire time there has been a Christian church, it is well known to the evil one that his time is short because Jesus is coming back. 
The same way that he went into the clouds of glory, he is going to come back, this time not as a baby, my friends, but this time as the victorious king of the universe. So what do we do between now and then? What do we do that love has come down and has wanted to live not only with us, but in us? What do we do? We have the opportunity to spread this same love, this same Jesus that came down at Christmas and went up and is at the right hand of the Father and is our advocate and our judge and loves us beyond all measure, we have the opportunity to point people to Jesus. Love those stickers, you know, that say, keep Christ in Christmas. Some people get upset with other people who write Xmas. Okay, okay, all right. You can get all hard-boiled about all kinds of things. But keeping Jesus the focus of Christmas goes without saying, really, but it has to be said these days because if you haven't noticed, they've forgotten about Thanksgiving. We just go straight from Halloween to Christmas. Does that tell you anything about where we are in Earth's history? The worship of the dead and the death culture of this world straight to the buying frenzy on Black Friday. So I say to you, church, wake up. Wake up and smell the mistletoe. Smell the oak. Smell the pine. Whatever it is that you need to know that the God of creation is alive and well and loves you and wants you to take that message to your world today, please, please know that love came down even though we are a rebellious planet. And when Peter learned that lesson, what did he see? He saw the Holy Spirit fall on all flesh. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. I want to see that. I want to be a part of that. I want to know what it's like to be totally possessed by the Holy Spirit. And when he says go, I go. When he says stop, I stop. When he says buy, I buy. When he says save your money, I save my money. When he says share your money, I share my money. Whatever he says, I will do because he is the one leading my life. This is why Jesus came. He came so that we could be part of his kingdom. He came so that going forward, we would have a purpose. We would have a place. We would know where we are headed had the extraordinary experience to hear from the lips of one of God's children this very week. I don't know who I am. Guess what? I got good news for you. We can know who we are. And we can know whose we are because of Christmas. Because love came down.